Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I please ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off or turn to silent your electronic devices? We have received apologies today from Alex Neal, MSP, and Anas Sarwar, MSP. Can I welcome Angela Constance, MSP, and Dave Stewart, MSP, who are attending in their places this morning. Item one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items three, four, five, and six in private today? Yes. Thank you. Item two is administration of Scottish income tax 2017-18. I'd like to welcome our witnesses this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Taylor, <coughs> Audit Director, Audit Scotland, Sir Amias Morse, Comptroller and Auditor General, and John Thorpe, Executive Leader, the National Audit Office. I believe that the Auditor General would like to make a brief opening statement, followed by Sir Amias Morse. Thank you, Convener. As you know, Scottish income tax is a major part of the new financial powers being devolved through the 2012 and 2016 Scotland Acts. These powers are substantially changing Scotland's public finances. Today's reports relate to the auditing of Scottish income tax in 2017-18. This was the first year in which the full amount of non-savings, non-dividend tax collected by HMRC was payable to the Scottish Government. It was also when the outturn for the 2016-17 tax year was established, setting the baseline for all future income tax reconciliation adjustments under the fiscal framework. The amount of tax collected will have a direct impact on future Scottish budgets, and the operation of the fiscal framework is complex. HMRC will publish the final UK and Scottish income tax outturns for the 2017-18 tax year in its 2018-19 accounts, and these will be reconciled to the forecasts incorporated into the Scottish Budget for 2017-18 with the associated adjustments incorporated into the 2020-21 budgets. So a lot of uncertainty for fiscal years still to come. The impact on the 2021 budget won't be known until the 2017-18 outturn is available. We already know that the number of Scottish taxpayers is lower than previously thought, but the impact of this on the budget is less certain. For example, lower than forecast tax revenues could be offset by similar reductions in the block grant adjustment. As more outturn data becomes available, it can better inform the budget process, the Scottish Government's financial management and the forecasting and reconciliation processes that are now central to the Scottish budget. Underlying all of this, of course, is the correct identification of Scottish taxpayers and the effective administration of Scottish income tax. Finally, convener, in considering these reports, it's important to be clear about the responsibilities of those involved. Firstly, HMRC collects and administers Scottish income tax as part of the UK's overall income tax system and is responsible for developing its systems to implement the Scottish Parliament's decisions on tax rates and bans. The Scottish Government funds this work and reimburses the costs of collecting and administering Scottish income tax. The Scottish Government also seeks assurances that the correct amount of tax is collected and properly accounted for. Secondly, for auditing, the National Audit Office audits HMRC's accounts and the Comptroller and Auditor General reports to the Scottish Parliament on that administration. I provide the Committee with additional assurance on the NAO's audit work in line with a recommendation from this Committee in 2014 and I also explain what the findings mean for the Scottish Budget. This is the fourth year of that arrangement. In summary, my report says that I'm satisfied that the NAO's audit approach was reasonable and covered the key audit risks. I'm also satisfied that the findings and conclusions in the Comptroller and Auditor General's report are reasonably based. And with that, I hand over to Sir Amias Morse. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Auditor General and, and Convener. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I won't go into the restatement of who I am because you've already had that covered off very well. Um, but just to be clear that I'm required under Section 80 HA of the Scotland Act 1998, as amended by the Finance Act uh, 2014, to report to both Scottish and UK parliaments on HMRC's administration of the Scottish Income Tax on behalf of the Scottish Government. Specifically, the Act requires me to, to report on the adequacy of any of HMRC's rules and procedures put in place in consequence of the Scottish rate provisions for the purposes of ensuring 
the proper assessment and collection of income tax charged at rates determined under those provisions. I'm also assessing and reporting on whether these rules and procedures are being complied with, the correctness of the sums brought to account by HMRC which relate to income tax, which is attributable to the Scottish Rate Resolution, and the accuracy and fairness of the amounts which are reimbursed to HMRC as administrative expenses incurred as a result of the charging of income tax. This report for the 2017-18 year is on the first year that I can report on all aspects of administration of Scottish income tax because HMRC published their calculation of the amounts brought to account for the 2016-17 year in July 2018. The key findings incorporating my conclusions are set out in paragraphs 12 to 17 uh, of the report on pages 7 and 8. And having completed the audit of the outturn calculation, we're satisfied that HMRC have brought to account the income tax revenue attributable to Scotland. However, the report notes that there are still necessary areas of estimation in this figure because of the timing of some processes and the data available to HMRC. The committee will no doubt be aware of the ongoing discussions around estimates of Scottish income tax. HMRC's estimate for 2017-18 used the same approach as previous years, and last year we discussed some of the uncertainty that this modelling creates. My report again highlights the specific limitations of, of the model used by HMRC for estimating Scottish income tax, and we are expecting HMRC to look at this in future years. Identifying Scottish taxpayers remains a continuing focus for our work with HMRC, and the report highlights how, they have, how they've been tackling this ongoing challenge. We'll continue to return to this to topic in future years, as it is essential to the, co the correct allocation of tax to Scotland. For the purpose of today, I will hope, hopefully help you understand my report, but obviously some of the issues raised within it will be for HM uh, Revenue and Customs as the audited body to respond to, and of course they're not here today. My team and I work closely with the Auditor General for Scotland and colleagues at Audit Scotland throughout our audit, and I'm very grateful for your support and work in, in doing that. And with that, I conclude my opening remarks. I, I should also say, for most of the technical questions on the audit, I'm going to turn to my colleague, John Thorpe. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you very much, Controller. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to start by just asking clarifying, clarification on a couple of points that have actually come up before in discussions around this table. Um, in the past, there's been some concern about uh, companies which have employees on both sides of the border, how they, how efficient they are at identifying Scottish taxpayers, because previously uh, there was mention made of one or two companies that were struggling on that. Has this all been resolved? Is this now an accurate figure? Um, in terms of the res there is continuing work to identify the correct uh, addresses, and HMRC's own work on, on, on address accuracy has found employers operating the incorrect code. Uh, I think in the report there we something like 90,000 cases were identified where, where the incorrect codes were being operated that identified by HMRC. So there is evidence that that is still an issue, and it is there is still a response in order to. I think there will need to be a continuing response in that area. There's a lot. That, that, could, that could be a significant difference in the revenue. Uh, yes, but it's, it, that is corrected. That's identified and, and corrected through the year. But there could be considerably more still. Uh, well, there could be. You never know whether you've identified everything, but the fact is there's a process in place. There's quite a lot of validation of, of, of addresses that is now going on throughout, throughout the year and will continue to happen. We, we try to draw some of those procedures out in, in Figure 10 of the report. The other thing that uh, has come up in the past has been the question of uh, workers in the oil industry, and there seemed to be a question as to where their tax fell north or south of the border. Has that been resolved? I can't answer that one specifically. I don't know what the position is on, on, on that, that particular issue. We can take that away and, uh, and have a look at that and talk to Revenue about it. Thank you. Just uh, coming now to the actual uh, audit report, we say here that uh, the total tax estimated of the, sh the share of the total tax of the UK estimated for Scotland 
Obviously, that's below our population proportion. The Auditor General uh, mentioned that uh, there's less taxpayers in Scotland than anticipated. Although, if we can find another 90,000, it might help the figures considerably. Um, how satisfied are we as to the reason behind that, that there are less taxpayers in Scotland? So, so we, we, uh, we, we've ex expressed reservations in the past, as we mentioned earlier, about the estimation process, because that's based on uh, the original estimate. It's based on a, a, a sample um, uh, rather than the exact information or the, the information that's now recorded within HMRC systems, both in the pay as you earn and the self-assessment system, which is, which is really what is ultimately driving the outturn figure and what, and what we are aud auditing. Uh, and I think our, our point is that now that we have that data and there's a lot of validation around individual addresses and, and uh, uh, the, the residents of, of, of Scottish taxpayers, that would be possibly a, a better, a more appropriate baseline for, for, for preparing an estimate. There are a number of things. I think the Office for Budget Responsibility have identified some of the challenges in actually ar arriving at the estimate under the existing approach. Can I just come back there for a second, if I, if, if I may, uh, to the, uh, Mr. Beatty, to the, to the uh, question of, of, of the 90,000 taxpayers who were identified by HMRC as, as, as being Scottish taxpayers. Well, it's good that they identified them, but I, I, would have a, I think the committee would be right to have an underlying concern that that shows you a moderate, a moderately significant error rate by employers. Mm. And I think it would be, if I can suggest to you, it's worthwhile keeping on that subject with HMRC and saying what we'd really like to do is to see the error rate by employers. It's nice that you found it, but there must be, this, I mean, it's fair to assume there might be some leakage around the sides of that. What we'd really like to see is that error rate coming down. In other words, that you work with employers to make sure they're getting it right in the first place not relying on you to correct it for them. Because that would, that would, I think the committee would be entitled to take more assurance from that. And, 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 and I think that would be quite a good thing to push it, to say to HMRC, well, are you doing a good enough job of briefing these employers? Are you really working with them so they get right first time? I think you make a very good point. Um, continuing this question of uh, estimates and so on, which is obviously a, a big issue, I'm looking at paragraph 1.27, which the bullet points there highlight a, a number of uh, types of estimates that uh, that uh, are being used. And I'm trying to understand the implications behind that and what kind of uh, error could come into that, that sort of sampling. I mean, for example, the third bullet point says the data uses, uh, used for PAYE includes all income types. That must be a huge distortion if there's non-savings non and non-dividend income included in that figure and in terms of dividing it up. So the, uh, well, this relates to the, um, I mean, the, the, the base of the estimate being on the, the survey of personal incomes, which is, I think we say is, is, is just 1.5% of the total population. Uh, first of all, that is done on a national basis. That's done for the whole of the UK. So then a number of assumptions have to be made as to how you translate that into the Scottish environment and and those assumptions and the and the projection of the of of that figure can can, can introduce quite a lot of uh, potentially introduce introduce error do we know what sort of i mean there must be some project projection as to what <coughs> what uh, percentage error is built into the into this calculation uh i i probably i can't really comment on that i know that the hmrc and the uh, office of budget responsibility to prepare their own estimates for for the UK, uh, the Scottish government, and then take some of those uh, that data, use some of the data, same data sources, but refine that for the Scottish em environment. And indeed, I think uh, 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 the the Scottish government's estimates are are, are are more slightly more accurate in this area. I'm just concerned because you know we, the amount of non -save, non savings and non dividend, the amount of savings income and d dividend income in the UK is going to be fairly substantial across the whole UK. And if that's coming into any sort of estimates that we're making, it's going to be distorted. Uh, yes, and I, and, I, and I think Jim Harrow, when he gave evidence to, to the Finance Committee last year, talked about some of these issues, and particularly around the profile in the, uh, of, of, of taxpayers in, in, across the whole of the UK compared to in, in Scotland and certain 
you know, potential differences in, in higher earners, and uh, which, 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 which could drive some, some uh, could drive in inaccuracy. Yes. I'm still trying to get my head around what sort of uh, risk there is here in terms of error. For example, bullet point one talks about sampling. Now, how do we get an accurate estimate? <coughs> We are not obliged to audit the estimate. That's that's the responsibility of, of 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 the OBR and HMRC. And I do believe that sort of those risks are are, are ones that probably Audit Scotland have also looked at in the context of the fiscal framework. As part of the audit, does it come does it come out what sort of percentage uh, risk they're looking at in terms of this? In terms of uh, if if that was a reconciliation with the outturn, which we have audited with the original estimate, that exercise hasn't hasn't been done. Uh, but I think that might be something that would be quite informative. I'd like to come in here, convener. <laughs> um, might be helpful just to clarify that the section of the report you've identified there, Mr. Beatty, is about the um, estimation of uh, Scottish tax receipts, which play into. The, um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's estimates that then play into the budget. Um, any errors there are reconciled later on, but that's obviously an additional source of volatility and uncertainty for the budget. Um, for example, we know that any shortfall against the estimates for the 2017-18 budget won't be reconciled until the 2021 budget, um, and current estimates are that that may be north of £100 million based on the information that's currently available, so it's not insignificant. Um, that's why I made the recommendation in my report to this committee that as more information becomes available, it will be important for HMRC to be refining their estimation methodology. Um, some of the information that is, ne is now needed was never needed or collected before. It's becoming available as we have more outturn data, and I think the estimation methodologies need to be updated to take account of that to minimise that volatility and uncertainty in the budget process, not because Scotland won't eventually be, be receiving the revenues that it's entitled to. But some of these estimates they're making, there's a sort of a, a built-in error, you know, when you're taking into account, and I'll come back to it again, dividend income and savings income. I mean, that is a built-in error. There must be some, I mean, the Scottish Government and, and so on are basing their calculations on the figures that are outturned from this. Now, to me, if there is a built-in error at the beginning, you have to, somebody has to know what the risk is in terms of how that will impact down the line. Mark Taylor? Yeah, just, just to get, put some figures around that. So, so what we do know is that when the 2016-17 baseline was established, there was a correction, and Fiscal Commissioner gave some com a commentary on that, which was in the order of half a billion pounds. And that was a correction to the expected tax take. Now, that also corrects the baseline for the block grant adjustment. So other things being equal, you'd expect those two things to offset each other, but it reset where that baseline was. The estimate that we're talking about is done on the same basis as that, so that's a look forward to what uh, HMRC thinks the outturn for 17-18 will be, and there's the, the, the implication, we don't know, the implication is that that correction will be, the, the, the estimate will be out of something of that order as well. The other bit of information we've got, and this is referred to in paragraph 42 of the Auditor General's report, is if you compare the 16-17 outturn on the Scottish rate of income tax basis with what was estimated the previous year uh, based on the same methodology, that was about 5% difference, which is again is aligned with that figure for the correction. So we've got a sense that using the survey methodology, you get numbers that are 5% more broadly than using actual data that comes out from HMRC. Now, the Fiscal Commission know that now, the OBR know that now, the Scottish Government know that now, so that's getting factored into future uh, forecasts and future budgets. In fact, current budgets, that's been already been factored into the 2019-20 budget. What this is about is when HMRC provide their estimate, how useful is that to have a sense of what the outturn and therefore what the reconciliation will finally be. And based on the current methodology, I think we would recognise it's not as useful as it might be. And what the Auditor General is saying is, is it would be helpful to, now that we've got the data in place for actual outturn, that HMRC uses that to change the way it does its estimate to make it more useful in a Scottish context to understand, well, where might we be heading in future budgets? Willie Coffey. Thanks, Convener. I wonder if I could just come back to the um, identification of Scottish taxpayers, please, that Colin Beattie led on there. Um, I understand from the work I've been doing or we've been doing in the Finance Committee that HMRC 
incorrectly identified 45 Scottish MSPs as being Scottish taxpayers. I mean, that, that gave that committee, and I'm sure this committee, some concern that this problem is still there after a wee bit of time to have this system bedded in. I mean, what, what on earth is going on if HMRC can't identify Scottish members of Parliament as being Scottish taxpayers? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with, with, with that particular issue. Um, we, I mean, we're looking, we're looking across the, the entire response of what they're doing and, and, and the countermeasures that they're employing in terms of getting using third-party data. Um, in terms of where those things don't identify sort of known cases, then we can pursue that and, 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 and take that up. But, uh, but by and large, there's a, quite a lot of effort looking at the whole sort of 2.5 million of Scottish taxpayers that, uh, um, that, the, that HMRC are doing. Uh, Do you understand the concern? If I may, Mr. Yes, Thanks a lot. <laughs> there's also a need for a bit of common sense about it, you know. In other words, it would be nice to make sure there was someone at HMRC whose job it was, and uh, you'd think there would be, and sometimes there aren't in large government departments, someone who's actually sitting looking at the Scottish results and saying, does this actually all stack up? Mm -hmm. I mean, are we going to look a bit pretty stupid <laughs> if we put something out about Scottish, you know, Scottish MPs and say they're not Scottish taxpayers? You know, come on. So there is often, often in these big, big systems, what you need is someone with enough perspective look at what's coming out and, and, and just ask questions that are kind of common sense. And I would press them on that. I think that's the bit that, you know, we just need to be sure. A lot of the big, the big systems are definitely getting better and more accurate. I would say you can see progress over the time, as you'd expect, and you're entitled to expect. But what you do need to do is to, and I was looking over the press coverage of these various items, and you do think some of these things were sort of, you would you you think they were avoidable, really, wouldn't you? Come on, from a, from a sort of common sense point of view. I mean, there are only 129 Scottish MSPs in the parliament. I'm not. I'm really not yeah. disagreeing with you a one little bit. 45 about of them it. wrong is. is I know. Like it's just not a common. There has not been a common sense review where somebody sat down and said, "Now, come on, these things you need to be sure you've got right." You're really going to catch it in the neck if you get this wrong. It's a dis you know, you'd, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? And we will press on that. Yeah, we will make inquiries about those specific cases. I mean, it, in, in your assessment of whether they're doing it correctly, you know, and whether their approaches are reasonable, was that part of your consideration? Yes, well, we, I mean, certainly we've identified the, the identifi identification of Scottish taxpayers is the key risk in this process. Yes. And once you have that S identifier within the system, then the, the system by and large should work work well. If you don't get that appropriate flag, then 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 it won't. It's just around the the allocation. Um, so uh, it's, uh, and we know we've reported for several years about the work that's been going on to try and <clears throat> get that base population identified. But you can't leave it at that. You've got it's actually what sits around that, and you, the continual review and testing of that using, as I say, third-party data and other types of scans, just to say where might you've got it wrong, and then investigating those uh, and, and, and making sure they're corrected. I mean, this this can't be a failure by the employer to allocate the S code. Surely, in this case, you know, we mentioned the ninety odd thousand that yeah. have been. That are possibly in error by the, because of the employer's failure to allocate the S code. Surely, surely that can't apply to the Parliament as an employer. Um, to forty-five. No. Of its well, we, we, I think the point we, we we can take that away and find out precisely what what happened there, and there may be some learning from from that. Why don't we undertake to do that? We'll actually look into it and let you know what happened in that case. Thank you. I think you're quite right to be. You're quite right. You're absolutely spot on, and it's one of these things where you just you know if if this is the best. Just need to try quite a bit harder <laughs> to get these sort of things right. I'm not going to defend it. Thanks. Can you? I mean, I think nobody suggesting, Sir Amy, is that our tax codes are any more important than anyone else's, but it doesn't give us much confidence. Mine no, no. was one of the ones that was messed up, and when you've got a convener of public audit tax code me mess messed up, it doesn't give much confidence to the Parliament or to the general public. And strangely enough, you know, and I find myself in this position, and I will say it, I agree with what you're saying, and I'm not taking a sort of defensive position about it, it probably doesn't quite reflect that actually things are getting better, progress is being made. It's just a sort of like 
as I said earlier, it's the common sense review that you make sure you get these things right. Uh, so in the back, you know, it's not enough to get to make system systemic progress. You need to have an alert eye looking over it, and they need to try harder at that. And that will be a message that we'll be taking back to them, I assure you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to stick with a similar point. I mean, you've said, Sir Amos, that uh, the identification of, of taxpayers is, is everything here. Um, just in January there, there were reports that around 30,000 Scottish residents were not correctly classified as Scottish taxpayers. And it turned out, uh, in a response from HMRC, the reason was that these taxpayers had not ticked the relevant box. Uh, to say that they were Scottish taxpayers. So my reading of that is they had apparently not ticked a box that would result in them paying higher tax. Uh, so should the identification, in your view, of Scottish taxpayers really be dependent on taxpayers ticking a box on an online self-assessment form? No. Uh, so uh, f we, we are looking into that case. That, that happened quite... Uh, after we produce this audit report, and it's at, it will be covered in our in, in our 17, uh, sorry, 18, 19 report, uh, that that box existed in the previous year, and but when it was ticked or not ticked, no action was was taken on it at that time. The process changed, as I understand it, for 18, nine, uh, in 18, 19, and they took action on that. Uh, Perhaps a more appropriate way to do it was actually to say we've got a variance here. Somebody's saying that they are or are not a Scottish taxpayer. We hold this information on them. If there's an inconsistency, that should be investigated before you actually make the change. Uh, my understanding is that the change took place and people were reclassified, perhaps without, without that uh, conversation or inquiry happening. So, thank you. Uh, a couple of things arise from that. So how, how are addresses checked throughout the year then? Is there any process in place to proactively uh, look into addresses? Yes, there is. So we, we, we talked about the, uh, the, the use of third-party data and also checking against our employers using the same information that HMRC is doing. So all of the, making sure that information is continually aligned uh, are, are on, on, on that particular case. And you know, by and large, that's what we would expect to happen. Uh, if they are misaligned, you don't necessarily make a change until you actually understand which piece of information is correct. You know, is the employer cor has the employer got it right, or have, have HMRC got it right? You know, and, and, and how do you do that reconciliation? I think in this case, uh, there was a misunderstanding of, on on perhaps around what the self-assessment form was was requiring, and people weren't quite clear, so they provided an indication, and HMRC just acted on a tick rather than rather than perhaps making the inquiry. And finally, just on that reclassification point, so what warnings or, or what is the process uh, to, to alert taxpayers who are now living in or predominantly in England who were previously predominantly in Scotland? Warnings, you mean a part of the self-assessment process? Or? Yeah, so, uh, so how do you... Uh, I'm now living predominantly in England, but previously I was predominantly in Scotland. Presumably that has an impact on my, uh, on how you will classify me. Uh, well, it's not, I don't do the classification. HMRC do the classification. How HMRC yeah. will classify me. So what warnings, uh, or, or what's the process there such that I'm classified properly and such that I know that I'm classified properly? Uh, I, I have to say, I'm not entirely familiar with, with what precisely the communications are with the, with the taxpayer in that situation, what, what HMRC would do proactively in that situation. I think that's something that we could, you know, we could absolutely look at and see what, uh, uh, you know, to be clear about that. Uh, I think at the moment, and I think the self-assessment episode uh, identifies that there can be a misunderstanding here and people can make a, what they think is a fair declaration and it not really understand how that is being used in that circumstance. But it seems to me that there needs to be a... In that situation, there ought to be <clears throat> a reaction to that and, as I say, uh, uh, an inquiry and a conversation with the individual before, before action is taken. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Morning. Um, just to follow up on that, if someone has an address available to them, let's say in Dundee, Cardiff, Monaco, and maybe a tax advisor in Paris, what address goes onto their tax return? <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, that's based on um, what I mean. I'm, I'm not going to. I mean, I could repeat to you the rules as determining where what should go onto their tax return should go onto their tax return 
is their predominant place of residence, as you know. Um, so the question is, if that, if the, and, and if that doesn't, and if that doesn't happen, what examination is carried out by HMRC? That's your question. So that's really the question. If you pick one of those three, let's say innocently, because that's where you may spend your time. Yes. How would HMRC look at that? Well, I suppose it depends on what. Uh, I mean, we've we, we've been speaking to HMRC about about how they do a risk in this in this particular case. And one of the things that we didn't have uh, before uh, we completed this report was the the updated view of the sort of strategic picture of risk, particularly as it related to Scotland and how they would respond to those particular types of risk. But there is normally it's a profiling of the taxpayer population, which the, clearly all cases necessarily can't be investigated, but they would identify those those cases where the, 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 like, the increased likelihood of error is or, or misrepresentation is and focus their resources in those in those areas. I'd expect and them to profile high net worth individuals much more strongly than anyone else. That's their normal practice. I don't see why it would be any different in this case. So, so when you say you would expect them to, you, you think they do? Well, we haven't do. seen the risk report, so I'm, yeah. but I'm, you know, I'm basing this on having done a lot of studies of, of HMRC Normally, they profile high net worth individuals more strongly than others. So I would expect if you've got an address in Monaco and everything, you've probably got quite a lot of money too, it's likely that they'll take quite a close interest in those sort of decisions, and they, they, and they certainly should. Sorry, sorry. sorry, could I just add to that? That process is a, it's almost like a baseline compliance process that would happen whether you lived in, uh, in, in London or in, or in Edinburgh. That would be the same for any member of the taxpaying public. Willie Coffey, did you want to ask about the framework? Hi, thanks very much, Convener. Um, you may recall that there was some discussion about the audit and accountability framework that should be in operation, and we've received a late paper yesterday, last night, about the revised arrangements for it. Um, one of the concerns that the committee had was that if this committee perhaps were to seek information from a, an equivalent body responsible and accountable to the UK Parliament, there seem to be a series of steps to the governments and down and so on to the various departments. And we were a bit concerned that that was a bit too much in terms of red tape. I think that's been partly addressed in the paper that I've read, but I wonder if you could explain to me how that particular concern has been resolved, if even partially. I don't speak for UK government, by the way, so as I'm independent of them, as you know, but I have seen that latest... Uh, paper. Um, let me try and say it like this. Um, as I understand the arrangements, normally what would happen is if, if there was anything that uh, the Auditor General of Scotland wanted to look at, wanted looking at in in a body that were, in, in a body that was performing work for Scotland in, in, in connection with the devolved function, they would say to the Auditor General of Scotland would say to me, "Would you do this piece of work for me? Because I'm the person with the audit rights. I've, I'm a statutory appointed auditor. That, that is, that will be the normal arrangement. You know, irrespective of all this toing and froing of papers, that's the normal arrangement." And normally, I would expect that that's how it would function. So we're only so this correspondence has been about the remote contingency, which is for some reason the Auditor General of Scotland asked me to do a piece of work, and for some reason I have a difficulty or or, or dis disagree about whether I can do that piece of work at the particular time. Um, and assuming that I couldn't work that out between myself and the Auditor General of Scotland. Uh, then I imagine under these arrangements that we would be, you know, if, if either of us was being unreasonable about it, I'm sure that you, 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 the committee, or the Public Accounts Commission would call us in and ask us what we were doing. That seems to me the way the arrangements would be likely to work as they, uh, based on that paper. I think that's common sense. I think trying to get into something which says, well, but what if, what if, what if, does... I'm driven into arguing extremely unlikely circumstances, but when you actually start looking at them and saying, so what if, what if a body here, what if the Auditor General of Scotland is entitled to overrule my judgment, which I hope would never be contradictory to, to, to hers, and then come in and do a piece of audit work 
And then I have to look at the fact that I've, because I'm the statutory auditor, I've got powers to examine subcontractors and all the other contracting work around it, which wouldn't go with step over rights. So, you know, it, it does create, it does have the potential to create mayhem if you go down such an extreme road. So I'm very glad that what we are, where we're at now, albeit vaguer, I admit, is actually going to throw us back on good offices and being transparent. So I'm, I'm, I'm in favour of that. And I think if any of us is behaving, uh, you know, were, were, to, were to behave badly, and I'm afraid I'm retiring in a few months, so it won't be me probably, but if, I, but if anyone were to behave badly, I'm quite sure that Parliament, looking bad and looking as if these arrangements don't work in front of Parliament, is going to be a pretty strong disincentive. So I, I can tell you, and I'm quite sure I would speak for my successor as well, that there's a great interest in being seen to work really closely between the two, between ourselves and Audit Scotland. That I believe these these somewhat inform, you know, somewhat broad arrangements enable us to do that to, the, to use our absolute best efforts to do that. Um, I've written to the committee, and I'm not sure if you've received that um, on the back of the uh, framework that's been issued just in the last couple of days. Um, I'm comfortable that many of the concerns I'd raised with the committee previously have been addressed in this version. I think it's helpfully simpler and more principles-based than it was before um, and clarifies the uh, roles and responsibilities of everyone involved. Um, as the CNAG has said, um, in practical terms, I think it's very likely that whoever the CNAG and the Auditor General for Scotland are, um, they will be able to agree appropriate ways of providing the assurance that this Parliament or indeed the UK Parliament needs. Um, and I have flagged with the committee that there is the potential risk because it agrees on because it relies on agreement between uh, the two national auditors at a Scottish and UK level that there is a risk that it may not be possible to fulfil the expectations of this committee or other committees of the Parliament as the new financial powers are fully um, devolved over the next couple of years. Um, I think it goes without saying that we both have um, a very strong interest and commitment uh, to using the framework as well as we can to meet what Parliament needs. And I think it will be important just to keep under review how that works in practice as we reach the point where the Scottish Parliament is raising 50% of what it spends in a context of much more uncertainty and volatility and obviously a requirement for this Parliament to have very clear assurance that the sums being raised are the right amounts and are being accounted for properly. Uh, so it's a step forward, and I think it, it will need to be kept under review as the new powers um, are fully operational over the next couple of years. Just, just supposing, just supposing this committee continued to be concerned or dissatisfied with HMRC's estimation of the number of Scottish taxpayers, mm -hmm. can this committee reach out directly to HMRC and have them at the table at some future meeting of this committee without going through all the hoops and asking the governments to agree and can, can we do that? The, the, the previous model suggested no sir Amos, that we had to go no, up no, the government along and No, we're, and we're talking yeah. about audit examinations only. Okay. So you could perfectly well call and you can and I think you should uh, call HMRC to ask them about these sort of things and they'll come. And that's different from what we're talking about is going into the organisation which you may or may not be familiar with, carrying out, looking at all the books and records, which you may or may not have ever done before, and carrying out an examination. All right, so that's, that's what this, all this discussion is about. It's not about having access to officials, which is a different question altogether. And I, I mean, you've had HMRC officials before you previously. I would recommend you have, I mean, I think, I think this hearing would be improved by having HMRC officials sitting at the table here, actually, is what I really think. Because then, instead of me sort of, actually, I'm criticising them, aren't I? Let's be honest. And, and I'd like to hear them answer that right there and then at the table. I think we'd have a, you know, it'd be a very valuable discussion for them as well as for you. I think there are some salient questions that need to be raised to give everyone confidence, this committee and, and beyond. Mr Coffey, are you, thank you. you okay? Thanks okay. Angela Constance. Uh, thank you. Convener, I have two quick questions. The, the, the first one is that the Comptroller uh, concluded uh, in his report that the £4.8 million uh, 
uh, that the HMRC invoice the Scottish Government for the work that they do on behalf of Scotland. You concluded uh, that that amount was fair and accurate. Uh, and I just wonder if you could speak in more detail about uh, what led you to that conclusion and the, the, the processes that informed that. Okay, so uh, there is... Um a process between the Scottish Government and HMRC which identify the tasks that need to be performed and, we, and, and bear in mind these are tasks that are absolutely additional to the normal uh, management of the income tax system so those costs are, are order, ordinarily borne by, strictly by uh, HMRC. It is actually specific additional work and additional procedures that would uh, arise specifically out of the Scottish rate, rate of income tax. So <clears throat> in the past, those might have involved specific system changes to get the IT up to date. Uh, in the future, if there was any specific compliance activity agreed between HMRC and the Scottish Government, which were re related specifically to Scottish income tax and the, and, and the risks that related to that, that's what would be covered. So there is a process of, of estimation and management and review that the Scottish Government exercise over this. We then review HMRC's records to make sure that the, those costs are properly allocated, attributed and extracted uh, you know, for that purpose. I'm also interested in the relationship between the Comptroller and Auditor General and Auditor General uh, for Scotland. So I just wondered what progress you're making in terms of the review of your memorandum of understanding uh, and whether you've established any timescales. I'll, I'll start, and then, uh, um, uh, if, and then you know, Mark can, can add. Um, well, the yes, yeah, so the, the the MOU was put in place about three years ago, with the expectation it would be reviewed after three years, uh, <clears throat> and we think it should, um, and not least because you know the environment has moved on. We, and, okay, we have the framework agreement, but, the, but probably more importantly, we're now we've now got the experience of doing the audit and working together, and so we're, we're, we we will be. In fact, today, after this meeting, we'll be getting together to review the lessons learned and actually start to recast that. Um, if you look at the memorandum itself, there are uh, numerous paragraphs, but there's probably just three or four at the end which really relate to the conduct of the audit, and those are the ones that we'll be really focusing on in terms of how we engage through planning, how we share information, uh, Audit Scotland's access to our records and how they oversee the audit and, 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 and the like, and in terms of assessment of risk. So there's, there's quite a lot of uh, engagement between us and... and uh, we, we think that can be reflected more uh, more effectively going forward. Thank you. Mr Taylor. Uh, just, just to add to what John says, and absolutely, uh, after we finish here today, we'll, we'll be continuing those discussions. I think the key point is when we get to the next year, the next audit year, the new memorandum we aspire to having in place, and so the next year's audit will be governed by that memorandum when it's updated. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you about the strategic picture of risk? I think HMRC was supposed to publish its most recent strategic picture of risk and hasn't done so yet. Do we know when it's likely to be published? I believe it has. It, it's not published, it's not shared publicly because it's, it's quite a sensitive document, but it is actually shared with the Scottish Government, uh, so they have access to it. And I do believe that that has now happened and we are, we'll, we'll be looking at that in the next audit uh, uh, round. Do you know what caused the delay? I'm afraid I don't. Mm -hmm. no, we, we did expect the, the, the document to be available at the time we did this current audit, and it wasn't. Can I ask what impact not having it had on the on the report before us today, on preparing that report, Auditor General? I think it's the question for John or Sir yeah, initially. I, um, so we would uh, perhaps uh, in, in part of this report is historical. It's looking at the extraction of data and in in, in information in, in a particular environment, but actually going forward the strategic picture of risk becomes very important because you, as divergence uh, starts to bite and actually understanding specifically how risk is assessed in that environment and what that means for compliance is going to be very important. So I do think in future uh, reports, as we start to look at what has happened in 1819 and what is planned for beyond that, uh, that, that will be very significant. Okay, so your, your understanding is the Scottish Government have that and perhaps we could see that, uh, get that from the Scottish Government. Sir Amias. Just to say, I don't think it needs to under, I don't think you need feel that it undermines your confidence in the report, but some of the discussions we were having would have been better had in light of that risk report, I, it's true. You know, in other words, pointing the way ahead, as, as, as John has said, as to how we can get better and better at running this system and, get, and identifying Scottish taxpayers more and more efficiently 
that should be led by, you know, the risk report should really lead that discussion. So it's that piece of it which I think would be improved by having current risk reports. And, and, and I, I think it'll be a better discussion next year because of that. And this is something that we can explore with HMRC if the committee decides to have them in for evidence as well. So that's very helpful. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? Okay. Can I thank you uh, very much indeed uh, for your time and evidence this morning. I now close the public part of this meeting. Thank you.